Hello and welcome to this download from Blackwell Online. My name is George Miller, and my guest today is Jane Robinson, author of Blue Stockings, an account of how women in the 19th and early 20th centuries gained access to those bastions of higher education that had been closed off to them, the universities. The book is by turns funny and anecdotal, but also thought-provoking. The question lingers in the mind after putting the book down, why was society, even in the 20th century, so resistant to women going to university? I started by remarking to Jane that one problem the first would-be undergraduates faced was the poor provision of secondary education for girls. That's right. The pioneers, several generations of them, realised that there had to be a foundation of, as you say, secondary education before any university um, could, could even be thought of. And a further problem was that even for boys, secondary education was not that formalised. Um, it was you know, it's thought automatic that um, wealthy young men would go on to university. But it wasn't really anything to do with um, how intellectual they were. It was to do with um, how much their parents could pay. So which were the pioneer institutions in Britain which admitted women? And on what terms did they admit them? Well, as far as secondary education is concerned, the um, the pioneers were people like Miss Buss and Miss Beale, who opened um, the Cheltenham Ladies College and North London Collegiate School. It was headmistresses like them who set in place what later became O-levels and A-levels, which set a sort of intellectual benchmark, which was used not only for men, but for women. And it was then, um, we're talking about sort of 1860s now, that further pioneers thought, well, if, if we can prove that we're clever enough to take a degree, then maybe we can persuade some universities to take us in. And the very first one was Girton, which was part of Cambridge, and that opened in 1869. And the irony is that although Cambridge was the first to admit women, it was the last to actually approve formal degrees for women. That's right. Um, you may be aware that Cambridge is celebrating its 800th anniversary this year, which is um, a very admirable birthday. But when you consider that women have only really been part of that history since 1948, because that's when they were allowed to take degrees, it's quite shameful, actually, mm. in many ways. You put it very succinctly in the book, talking about institutions of, of higher education in general. You said admission is one thing, assimilation quite another, and the, the book really demonstrates that fact. Yes, well, to start with Girton, I mean, it was opened, as I said, in 1869, and it was nominally part of Cambridge University. But the woman who opened it, Emily Davis, was quite aware of the fact that if she tried to get her students established within Cambridge too soon, uh, then it would be counterproductive. So she opened what later became Girton in a small domestic house in Hitchin, first mm. of all. And then they moved to within two miles of Cambridge, which is where they are now. But you'll note that they're within two miles of Cambridge. Mm. They're, they're not even in the centre at that stage. The sense in which it was considered dangerous both for the male undergraduates to have women nearby and for the female undergraduates to, to be in too close proximity to men. In the early days, it was very much considered to be an experiment, which the academic establishment hoped um, would prove itself to be completely untenable. And to make their argument more robust, they brought in medical mm. opinion at the time, which held that if women studied too much and used their brains, then their wombs were quite simply atrophy because there's mm. only so much energy to go around in a woman. Mm. And if she used it all on book learning, there'd be none left. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it sounds almost funny to us now, but one of the most um, striking pictures in your book, I thought, was of the, the riots in Cambridge in 1897, which were about a vote to allow women to be formally admitted to the university. And there were all sorts of violent and really very aggressive scenes taking place there when that, when that vote was happening. It was very frightening. It was, it was quite um, atavistic. I mean, the grounds for those who thought that women should be allowed to take degrees uh, were rooted in the fact that London University had been awarding women degrees since 1878. Mm. And other universities, such as in Manchester and Liverpool and Leeds, were following in London's footsteps. But Cambridge was holding out, as you say, it was 1897, quite some time after London had started um, awarding degrees. And a vote was held, and the majority was extremely strong against taking degrees. And while the voting was going on, the undergraduates, the males in Cambridge, rigged up an awful sort of effigy mm. of 
a blue stocking on, on a bicycle and they tore this effigy up and, and they took it to the women's colleges, to Newnham and to Girton and they stuffed bits of this effigy through the gates and they lit bonfires and they threw fireworks and they jeered and they roared and it was really quite shocking. Mm, as you say, quite atavistic. I mean, it's quite savage scenes really. Yes. I'm not quite sure what, what they were scared of, to be honest. Well, that's what I was going to ask had... you. <laughs> what, did, what, do yes. you what do you think, the, what do you think the, the main source of the fear was? The Cambridge experiment, as it was called, ha- had proved to be really quite successful for women because even though they weren't allowed actually to graduate, they were working for degrees hmm. and they were getting astonishingly good results, often um, heading the lists. And I guess this was really quite um, worrying for the academic establishment. But why they feared it quite so passionately and, and quite so, so fiercely, I, I'm not sure. So it may have been that they thought that true academic study would be somehow diluted by women, somehow contaminated. They didn't seem to think that um, women could multitask at all. And so that if they were hoping to be intellectuals, they could only possibly be highly emotional intellectuals or intellectuals whose mind was really on, um, on doing the laundry. And I think they thought that the value of, of academic learning would, would be somehow decreased by women taking part in it. And what kind of backgrounds did those early generations of female undergraduates come from? I had assumed that like the men who went to university, that the early women who went to university would all be um, rather wealthy. But that was not the case. I think because of the farsightedness of those teachers that I was talking about earlier on, who'd set the ball rolling by establishing robust examinations for women, I, I think that those teachers recognized in some of their pupils a spark that would be lit by university. Mm. And it wasn't always the fact that these um, young women in their care would be able to afford to go to university. So even in the earliest days, you got headmistresses actually putting their hands in their own pockets to fund students that they thought would have promise mm. through university, which is very moving to read about.